Good morning and uh, welcome to our UMass. Uh, it was designed to be a UMass roundtable. Ed Ciro from U UMass Lowell is having a little bit of technical difficulty right now. So we're hoping he's gonna be joining us in progress. We'll see how that goes. But we have Samantha Pulley from UMass Amherst who's here right now and ready to hit the ground running uh, to, start, to start us off here on a Wednesday. We're close to the deadline. We're coming down to it. Um, you know, for the, both the UMasses, that deadline is going to be the fifth, not the first. Uh, which is nice for us. Like it's nice not to have a deadline in the middle of Halloween weekend. So thank you, Samantha, first and foremost. Um, maybe uh, sometimes as we get started here, I like to do a, a couple of like just icebreakers to get us off the ground and we'll see if anyone, rather than sitting in silence with a virtual waiting room and see if anyone else comes in. Uh, Samantha, in our office, we've decided that we're no longer allowed to use the word unprecedented to describe the fall of 2020. Uh, is there a word that you are tired of hearing this admission cycle? Or if you could replace the word unprecedented, what would you pick? Hmm. I, that's a hard one. I don't know if there's a word that I'm tired of hearing. I guess it's so, so I guess the word that I'm tired of hearing this admission cycle is sorry. So I don't, <laughs> I, like that. I, like that I mean that in the best way possible. I think that I get a lot of students and families and counselors apologizing to me because their tests got canceled or just things that are related to the pandemic that they have no control over. And it, I understand, I'm going through these same things too. We're all going through it. You don't need to be sorry. We understand it's okay. <laughs> I love it. And also, so man, here, here's my other one. We've all spent, you know, or most of us spent roughly six months at home, like in, in lockdown. What is a task around your home that has been on your to-do list for the whole time that you just haven't gotten around to doing? <laughs> okay, so um, I actually moved during the pandemic. So I am based out of our Mount Ida campus in Newton. So I now live in the Boston area and I have been supposed to be building an ottoman out of a tire. And it looked so cool. I saw it on Pinterest and it still has not happened. Yeah, <laughs> I was really excited to make it, but it just fell by the wayside. Those Pinterest projects, you're gonna get, you're making it the same day you make some sourdough bread. It'll be perfect. Uh, all right, so Samantha, let's, uh, let's get started. You know, I think, um, you know, the big thing that we like to do with the, the council coffees is we kind of want to take, what do we know or we think that we know based on kind of, rumors or reputations or, you know, the biases that we might have in advance, you know, and then we sort of break it down and say, well, what are, how do these things really work and how does it really all come together? And, and so I think the, the first one is like, people hear state school and they hear, they make some of these uh, assumptions about what a state school is that might be resource wise, and it could be, could be good or bad resource wise in terms of what that might look like. As you kind of think about that, you know, what do resources look like at UMass Amherst compared to, you know, kind of a, a similar private school or uh, something that's comparable? Yeah, so what I've noticed actually having attended a small private liberal arts school for college is that going to a state school, especially a larger public school, a larger school um, like, you, like one of the UMasses and especially UMass Amherst is that the amount of opportunities for resources and other supports on campus is insanely significant. There's so many opportunities to get some, some sort of resource um, to support you. Part of it is because of state regulations and then also just because of the, diverse, the diversity of the student body. So we have to cater to all types of students. There's not one specific UMass student or one specific student that goes to a state school. So we have to make sure that we have services available to all of them. I did. And what about like, you know, UMass is an R1 school, right? Like what do labs look like? What do some of those classrooms that you think about just the way that you're competing that way? How is, how is UMass built? Yeah, so I think that there's been a lot of push for research universities and research in general in the college realm. So we definitely have to make sure that we are competitive in this game of of higher ed research. So we are constantly investing in our labs. We actually have um, a building on campus that other facilities use to conduct their labs in. So we make sure that our labs are constantly up to date. They're constantly um, just 
looking to the future in technology and making sure that they're well equipped for not just our students, but outside organizations that would in turn hire our students as research assistants. Absolutely. Fantastic. Uh, I, and, you know, I think, again, when we think about that UMass name and the UMass reputation, you know, you're, you're the strongest public school in the state. You have that reputation. Um, it is well earned. You're one of the best public universities in the world. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm blushing. <laughs> but you, like your institution obviously has a very special connection to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the state. And I, and I guess like there's obviously the reduced tuition, but beyond that, how do you kind of see your relationship and your responsibility to to the state of Massachusetts, you know, as the as the UMass school? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually feel incredibly responsible to uphold the good UMass name. Uh, we wouldn't be here without our in-state students and without our in-state families. We're about 70 to 80, we bounce anywhere from 70 to 80% in-state. So we really try to uh, foster really strong relationships around the state and make sure that we are putting a good face forward because we are Massachusetts, we are UMass. <laughs> I love it. And like people didn't get to see it, but when, when you logged on, your your picture is you with Sam the Minuteman. So I mean it's like, yeah, where are you mass? Where this is what it's supposed to be. Um in terms of like uh you know, we're a small private school, you know, and there's definitely the again, some of those talk tracks. I don't know if I want to say it that way, or those, you know, students choose CM because they want that small, small school, small community like everybody knows your name. And then sometimes that jump to, you know, a public state school like UMass, there's that fear of, am I going to get lost here? Or is this too big? Um, how do you kind of develop community in, when you have a large student body that everyone is, you know, coming together like this? Yeah, so we always say that you can make a big school feel small, but you can't make a small school feel big. So part of how we do that is that every student actually comes in automatically with two advisors. So they have their academic advisor who's making sure they graduate. And then they also have a peer advisor who is just an older student in their major or their interest area who's helping to make sure that they're adjusting to campus. They know what resources are available to them. They're joining clubs and organizations. And then every time that they add on like a pre-professional track or the honors college or a second major, they're getting another advisor with that. So that's just one way that we're making our school feel smaller. We have our RAP programs. So that stands for residential academic programs, such as living with students with similar interests. So you're building your community and building your niche the second you step on campus your first semester. Um, and then just the amount, of, the amount of advising and the amount of um, organizations that are available on campus. So we have over 300 clubs. They line up like, in um, Pitch Perfect or Monsters University to have their clubs there. So they're they're actively trying to be inclusive in their community and trying to bring, bring especially first year students in because this is a really, this, it is a, a pretty large campus and um, it's a lot of students. So they just wanna make sure that you are feeling supported and you're adjusting well. When you, a, I love the Monsters University reference. We just watched that this weekend. So my five-year-old was over the moon. Like I, the wrap around here, you know, the worlds are colliding. Um, when you, in a normal year, right? Because we're talking about students in the class of 21, 22, 23, or the grad, high school graduating classes. Um, when, when things go back to normal and like, what are some of your favorite clubs? What are some of the favorite traditions that you have on campus? Like, how do those clubs build that community when, in, in, again, in a normal year when, which we all hope is going to be fall 21 at least? Yeah, so I guess I have a little bias towards our tour guides and our diversity fellows. So those are probably my two favorite organizations outside of like our squirrel watching club, which I only love that one because why do we have a squirrel watching club? <laughs> But um, other than them, our diversity fellows and our um, tour guides, they are, they are the most familial organizations that I have ever seen. And I feel very grateful that I'm able to see them up close. They have their bigs and littles, like they're in a sorority. They have family lunch and family dinner. And then they're also super integrated within our admissions office. So we also know 
the tour guides and the diversity fellows, they have that access to adults post-graduation and are able to ask us questions or help us. Um, we are able to help them with finding jobs and networking and everything. So I just, I don't, they're amazing and they do incredible things. And I, you know, I think to, to editorialize for a second here, I think that's one of the things that we end up seeing with a lot of students who end up going to state schools is because there's so many different opportunities there, you find that one specific group and, you know, people are passionate about that group and they found that when they were a freshman and then they see a freshman following behind them uh, and that real, I love the advisor relationship that we end up seeing at UMass where people feel connected early and just like brought along and, and in, it's, a, it's great. And I think when we, you know, you have that advisor relationship when a student is on campus, but then you also, UMass is known for its network of alumni, especially in the state of Massachusetts. Feels like you, you bump into a lot of UMass Amherst uh, graduates, right? So uh, how does that alumni network, you know, which again, like let's take it from the I know there's an alumni network to kind of the Mr. Wizard, well, how does that work? Um, you know, how does that alumni network end up serving your current students or when students graduate, how do they, they, they take advantage of that? Yeah, so we have some amazing, passionate alumni. Maybe some of them are on the call today. If so, thanks for being here, glad to have you. Uh, and they're actually really, still really active at UMass and, and in this part of the community. Um, so they are, built, oh, yes, I see one, one UMass alum. <laughs> um, so they're very active still on campus. They're actually coming to our college fairs with us during a normal year. Um, so they're still, they're still helping us to recruit. And then um, we also have where they're actively taking part in um, some of their schools and colleges. So for example, we have the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences in DC. So we take a group of students who are interested in political science, uh, legal studies, that kind of realm, and we take them to Washington DC for, I, I believe, a summer, and they get free housing, they get a stipend, and they also get um, an alumni to work with directly so that they have support while they're down there and they're also working at well, either in the White House or some sort of government organization down there so that they get that firsthand experience. And having lived in DC before, it's an amazing city. I cannot imagine life there if you got free rent and a stipend to live on, but that's just one aspect of having a really strong alumni base. We also have a club that's women in leadership and they're bringing alumni from who graduated in the 80s to come back and work with these young women and who are interested in going into the political realm or the medical field or what have you, just whatever interest area we're finding, we can easily find alumni, which is wonderful that it's so easy to find alumni in all of these fields and because they're all doing so much, well, they're all being so successful and having so much to do uh, that are willing to come back and talk to these, these young women and mentor them throughout their four years here. And I, I guess one thing that I think is maybe underrated about UMass Amherst is, I mean, I grew up in South Hadley, right? So I, that five college system in that area, like what's the kind of like the relationship to the community right there? What does that look like beyond the UMass Amherst campus, you know, five colleges and everything else? Like what is that feel that again, kind of supports students and brings them along? So I think that there's so much community support outside of just the five colleges, even the whole Amherst public school system. So um, our students are constantly going over to the schools within the school system to help tutor, to teach after school classes or um, have, or be the, uh, the advisor for clubs and organizations. They are going into just the community, doing community service, cleaning up, um, just overall helping and being good citizens and active members of the Amherst community because it's more than just UMass. UMass, it's easy to think that UMass is its own separate thing. It even has its own zip code in Amherst, but it's not. It's part of an Amherst family. It's part of Western Mass. So we try to cultivate that relationship and even not just in the Amherst area, but also in Springfield and Holyoke and just all throughout that whole uh, 291 belt. Absolutely. 
It's a love. It's lovely. It's it's you know he's got foliage and it's fall and it's fantastic. Uh, big Western Mass fan here. And I guess like beyond that, also you know UMass travel abroad like or study abroad. How does that play into your curriculum and how does that impact your students? Again, having that kind of network. Yeah, so we actually encourage every student to study abroad and we've actually built some programs that historically have a more strict curriculum to build in study abroad, like our nursing program specifically has nursing abroad in like Spain and Ireland and South Africa um, and, some, and a few other countries as well. And then um, there are some programs where you're actually required to either take a language or study abroad. So studying abroad is a big part of our university. You don't have to do it. We always, we just encourage you to do it. And you can do either the five college consortium, you can do um, the domestic exchange program. So going studying abroad within the US and then there's abroad abroad and you can do classes, research, internships, volunteer work. So there's, we're just trying to build a more global community, especially because within our community as itself, we have a lot of international students. We have professors coming from other countries. So we want to make sure that our students are reflecting that diversity and also our, are um, taking advantage of it and getting a better understanding of where people are coming from and understanding backgrounds and, and um, cultures. Amazing. Uh, in, in terms of, you know, and we're, again, we kind of planned for a round table. So Samantha and I, I think we're, we had planned 30 to 40 minutes of conversation with two different schools and now we've got one school and we're going kind of quickly. So um, we definitely want to have plenty of time for Q&A. You know, as I said at the beginning, we're getting close to that November 5th deadline. So um, if you have questions, I would love to hear them in a moment. But I think the big question, Samantha, that especially a lot of senior families are working through right now is, is you know, obviously this is, um, you know, I'm not going to say unprecedented, but a wacky admission season. You know, things are very different. Um, how has your office adapted to kind of the needs of this pandemic? How, is, how have things shifted? How do you see that impacting uh, the high school graduating class of 21 and beyond? Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest thing that it's adapted is, of course, our location. So we are all working from home, which um, has its pros and its cons. So I was able to just get up this morning, get going and get straight to the computer. I didn't have to drive into work, which was wonderful, saving gas. And but you have an unbuilt ottoman staring at you. So that's the down. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Maybe during my, my lunch break <laughs> that I'm still home for. <laughs> But it, it also has helped us or allowed us to ramp up our um, recruitment and reach out to places that we don't typically go to. So uh, even schools within Massachusetts that we may not have reached in a while or have been able to visit, we're able to get to them virtually. Uh, we also expanded our territories. So we're expanding to states like Minnesota and uh, Missouri and Texas. So we're we are actively looking for a more diverse student population, whether that be diversity and in, in making sure students of color are included in the conversation or adding in um, or geographic diversity. So expanding those territories. So that's something that we are actively working on and that is building a better and stronger community within our campus. So we're really excited that that has been an outcome of this less than exciting pandemic <laughs> and we talked about it and we talked about before parents got on too and so like i almost feel well you hate when people say sorry but i'm going to apologize that we have to have the testing question right how is you know the the big testing shift sort of how do you see that impacting your office and how applicants are going to be read this year so i personally think that it'll increase our application so for those of you on the call who may not know we are completely test optional for the next three years including this year and actually we will review every student's application both with and without their test scores and if their scores help them we'll keep them there and if they hurt them we'll just throw them out and we won't we won't include them in our review process so i think that it'll yeah i think that hopefully it will increase our applicant uh, well, I say hopefully that it'll increase our applicant pool, but I'm also the one that has to read all the applications. So hopefully not too much, <laughs> not an unmanageable amount. But it also, I do hope that it allows us to receive applications from students who are historically marginalized or um, tend to have more difficulty getting test scores to us or taking the tests in general. Perfect. It's, uh, and you know, we, 
again, this is, we were the conversation we had before everyone else popped on. Uh, some people are experiencing some stress or anxiety right now because they had a test and it was canceled and they can't find a test center or, or they weren't able to take the test at CM. If you were a senior and you haven't taken the test yet, don't take the test, right, Samantha? Are we in it? So, um, absolutely. absolutely, yeah. So it's focus on your grades, get those up as high as you can because course rigor is gonna be the, the driving factor this year. Um, well, okay, like I said, we're, we're definitely running a little fast this morning, which is good because we would love to hear from um, parents. If your, your son is currently working on a UMass application and you just have a question about the process, if there's a question about if you're not the parent of a senior and you want to hear more about a specific program or area of UMass, uh, you can add it to the chat. You can uh, jump on in and we'll have a conversation. Great. Yeah, Robin, uh, why don't you unmute yourself and pop on? Good morning. Hi. Um, Good morning. Um, Sam, you're doing such a great job. You're re representing UMass beautifully. Um, and I have to say, I've been kind of a counselor coffee junkie and also I'm watching um, webinars from authors of books and Facebook groups that I'm in. And this is probably the 36th session that I've sat in on. Um, and I have to say, you just gave the most transparent answer about what you're gonna do with test scores that I have heard. And obviously I've listened to a lot. So thank, thank, you. You, thank you for that. I, I just really appreciate that. Um, my son is interested. He's a senior in applying. Um, actually, I think we're, we already submitted his application. Um, he's interested in a certificate program that's through the consortium um, in addition to his degree. And I was wondering if you anticipate, I know it's, we all hope that the fall will be back to normal or 85% of normal or just much better than it is right now. But you know, if it's not, are there any problems with that right now with students needing to take classes through the consortium that might impact his plans to earn that certificate within a certain time frame? That's my first question. So I have not heard of any issues with taking classes through the consortium because the wonderful thing is that those classes are also online as well. So students of any of the five colleges are able to just use the registration system of the other college to, um, to get into those classes. And I, my hope is that actually they may have opened up the classes a little bit more to allow for more students in them since it is um, virtual, well, since they are virtual. But again, that's just my, my hope and my speculation. Don't take that for, uh, for fact. But I have not heard of any, any issues with uh, getting classes through the consortium. I don't foresee that being an issue either. Awesome. Um, and then my second question, and I know you don't have a crystal ball. Wouldn't it be nice if we all had a crystal ball? Um, but, uh, you know, I did, I'm following social media for all the schools that my son is applying to and watching what's going on. And um, I know that you're not bringing students back 100% in the spring. It's, you're bringing more students back in the spring than you currently have, but not 100%. Um, and so I'm wondering if you, if there are talks about what you would do for accepted students in the spring. It's very challenging to be looking at everything virtually without the possibility of being able to get the feel in person. The virtual tours are great and all the schools are doing a great job, but it's a big decision to make without being able to do things in person. Right, so are you, do you mean for like our open houses and those events? We're, um, uh, I'm, we're a little crazy and my son went to the open house last fall. So we, you know, we have had an opportunity to, to spend time on campus um, mm -hmm. and in the area, checking out the restaurants and, you know, every, all the cool things that you're at the area has to offer. And we loved it. Um, but just in terms of, you know, when some acceptances come in and needing to make a decision, I think we were hoping for a second look before. Right. So that's completely understandable. So we actually just announced that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we are coming back about 60%. So our office hasn't had the chance yet to really process it and figure out what we're going to be doing for the fall. We're actually still, I'm sorry, what we're going to be doing for the spring. We're actually still finishing up the fall. So this is our last week of recruitment. So we're just trying to power through it. Uh, even though it, recruitment is virtual this year, it still leads with its own um, challenges and 
and um, it's very, it can be very tiring as a whole. <laughs> but uh, so we're just, we're trying to finish up this last week of travel. We have our reading season starting up and we're also going to be working on what this means for next spring for bringing, potentially bringing students on campus. Thank you. And I, I have learned that sometimes being a little crazy pays off. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sorry. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Not a problem. I was talking, and again, like I've had so many of these virtual conversations. I, I One thing that I've heard from a few people is this is going to be like these next few classes are going to be the most well-researched group of students that we're going to ever have entering university because it is like sometimes it's like you walk on campus and you fall in love and it's like oh it's all magic but it's not necessarily grounded in research of programs or fit or feel um so hopefully you know for to to robin's point you know if things are clearing up a little bit in the spring we'll have the research and then we can have the love affair with falling in love on a campus after you get there um so man, in terms of um once a student is accepted or once a student is in the pipeline are there any resources of like peer mentorship? Do you pair, do, do you have like for accepted students, if we are doing some virtual events where they can talk to some people on campus, like what, um, what, what other resources? Obviously the ideal is, hey, accepted students can visit in, you know, February, March, April, somewhere in there ahead of May. But if, if that doesn't go right, what else might be there? So right now, the one resource that I am recommending students check out the most are our uh, virtual student guided visits or virtual student guided tours. So these are led by the tour guides and it's like they're going through an actual tour, just not in person. And it's student guided, like I said. So it's completely led by the tour guides. There's no admissions counselor on the call except for to triage uh, questions in the chat. So you're getting real authentic student focused answers to your questions, you're, get, you're hearing from the student voice. So actually when students, when uh, prospective students register for those, we actually re recommend that you register for more than one because every day there's new students on the call. So you're getting new answers to the same questions. So even though you don't get that whole, I'm on UMass campus feel, you do get the UMass community feel. Mm -hmm. I love that. And different experiences come through. Again, someone might experience the campus in, in two very different ways. That's great. Uh, Teresa, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Hi, Samantha. Um, thanks so much for doing this session. I'm sorry I was very late in joining. So I missed most of what you said in the beginning. Um, but my question, and maybe you already talked about this, but um, I'm just wondering more about the advising programs um, for students that may have come in undecided within a certain area. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how that works? Um, my son has no idea what he wants to study at this point. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so that is actually one of my favorite ways for students to come in is undecided. The national average for changing your major is about four times. When I went to college, I changed my major seven times. So I probably should have come in <laughs> undecided. Driving that um, average. Also, <laughs> yeah. Also, I changed my major seven times, but I was also able to study abroad three times and do four internships. So it was okay and graduate a year early. So it's okay to change your major and be undecided in what you want to do. So for our exploratory track program, you're actually coming in undecided, but within one of the schools and colleges that make us up. And you're getting still those same two advisors that you would get whether you if you came in with a real major. Um, so your academic advisor and a peer mentor within that college. So um, your academic advisor actually is helping you to explore all the majors within that college that, you're, that you are interested in, but also across the university because we have a lot of programs that most students don't know about coming out straight out of high school, like social thought and political economy. And before the pandemic, uh, public health was not well known, well, not, not super well known um, for incoming students. So they help you to get a better understanding, well, help the students get a better understanding of their interests, future career paths, and help them to find their own, the major that's right for them. And if they start off in one college and they realize, you know what, I do want to major in public health, they'll help them to make that transfer as well. And then also there's that build your own major program. So if they realize, you know what, my passion is in fashion design, you can build that major and you will get another build your major advisor. 
Okay, great. Thank you. And so, and how long does that last throughout the four years that you're there or? Yeah. So the building your major lasts for however long you have left at the university. So if you're a junior, you have two years of that build your major, or if you start as a first year student, you have four years of it and you're sitting with their, with an advisor and they're helping you to map out the next few years of your academic career. Okay, great. Thank you very much. No problem. Samantha, we had a question come through on, on a private chat. Um, and I, it's very hard to kind of predict, again, as, as Robin brought up with that crystal ball, we have no idea how many applications are going to come into your office this year and what reading them is going to look like necessarily. When are you, in terms of your office's timeline, do you have a goal for when early action dec decisions are going to come out? Is that, you know, is that a hard line? Is that a loose line? Like, what are your thoughts about timing? Right. So historically, we tried to get them out about, well, starting in mid-December and then through mid-January. Right now, um, just to give us some more flex room and um, accommodate for being at home, we're shooting for early January to get it out. All right. Good luck. I don't envy you in that task. Uh, it, it, it should be a, a very interesting reading season. If there are other questions, by all means, I, we've had some great questions so far. So you could either type it into the chat or if you want to, you know, pop in and ask your question that way, that's, you're welcome as well. At this moment, I always wish I had like theme music so that while Samantha and I like stare at each other, we could, you know, we'll have the Jeopardy theme in the background or something. You know, that's actually exactly what was paying, playing in my head as we were waiting. <laughs> we're right there. We're, we're totally live. Well, uh, I, can, I can always come up with more questions. Um, I have right. endless, endless questions. Um, right. And Sam, could you talk a little bit about what virtual learning, distance learning looks like for, um, I guess, your, the whole student community, but of course, we're most concerned about freshmen, particularly freshmen that um, you know, I know that all the resources are available and that centers are open and, you know, um, but how, what does virtual learning look like at UMass? Is it a combination of, prof I'm hearing stories from various colleges of things like professor is giving a syllabus and reading assignments and paper and test dates and no actual instruction. Um, it like no teaching and the students are kind of on their own learning independently. And then I've heard the absolute opposite of wonderful daily lectures, um, you know, that are recorded and could be viewed at a later time if the schedule doesn't work out conveniently. So, you know, what's it looking like at UMass and, and how are you supporting freshmen with remote learning? Right, so I can't speak for all of the professors um, individually just because there's so many, but overarchingly, they are going the route of actually delivering their lectures, uh, providing the reading material and recording the lectures for students who either can't be on the call at that moment or would like to re-review the lectures. Thank you. And, and then Sam, Samantha, did that like, in, in, do you have any idea of like a, a broad, you know, are there mostly synchronous classes or asynchronous or if someone needs to be participating in a lab, like how has UMass answered some of those issues? Yeah. So from my understanding, most of the classes are still synchronous, mm -hmm. um, again, with those still with the recordings, but also they're being incredibly flexible for students who are not in the same time zone. So. Yeah, so it's, it's a new concern, right? Like how do we teach, especially with an international student, you know, you're on the opposite yeah. side of the globe. Um, and I think something that comes up with, with each different school, and I don't know how it's impacted UMass necessarily for, for fall of uh, 2020, but how many students did you have deferring over the last year? And like, do you impact those deferments having, uh, or do you anticipate those deferments having an impact on the high school graduating class of 21? So on a typical year, we have about 100 defers. And this past year, we only had about 60. So that was great. <laughs> um, we are well, I'm guessing on... no impact on the class of 2021, right? I'm sorry? So I'm guessing the, the impact on like this year's graduating class is gonna be like nil. Right, yeah. So we're hoping that not too many students need to defer. So we also don't allow 
students to defer for any old reason. So um, it needs to be for a medical issue or joining the military or religious um, reasons. So with, all, with everything going on, I guess less students are joining the military or doing a lot of students, um, especially of like the Jewish background, will go to Jerusalem or, um, or Israel, that's where, that's where they went. They go to Israel for uh, a year and serve in the Israeli military. And I, I'm not quite sure if they're still doing that uh, this year or if as many students are still doing that. So we, have, we did see a, a pretty good decrease in defers and hope okay. to, that trend continues. Well, there you have it. Good to hear. Other questions? Come on, someone's got one more. All right, with that, I think we'll uh, we'll wrap up. Samantha Foley uh, from UMass Amherst, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And you're back today in this exhausting virtual travel season. Uh, you're, you're double dipping at UMass today. Uh, I'm sorry, at CM today. So you are back at noon, right? Yes, for um, a student presentation. Uh, or parents, you should have gotten that link with this week on Baker Street, or if your son signed up on SCORE ahead of time, uh, we have that link. So at noon, that is the only hour long session that we are doing all uh, fall long. And it's because uh, we have so many people who love UMass and it should be a very popular and well attended session. Um, Samantha, thank you so much for everything. If you, would you be able to write your email address in the chat just so that way, if a parent does have uh, you know, you have a follow-up question, there's something, you know, that's just a little bit unclear or, you know, things that might pop up as we, uh, we go through the rest of this admissions season and hopefully acceptances and selecting UMass, it's, it's going to be a, a great ride and a good year. So thank you so much, everyone. And I hope you all have a great day. Thank you, Samantha.